morning. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, as we continue uh, just walking through uh, Paul's letter to the church here, verse by verse. And uh, looking around this morning, and you guys are in the Christmas spirit. Uh, a lot of you are, I didn't get the memo, all right? <laughs> I got a couple. I had a couple weeks. I thought before I had to get my my red out, but you guys are ready to go. And yeah, you know, the truth is, I love I love Christmas. Uh, I love uh, the excitement. I love the anticipation. I like all the family traditions that are wrapped up in Christmas. Uh, it truly is for me one of the most wonderful times of the year. And I know even as I I say that this morning, that's that's not true for everyone. You know, for for some of you here. Uh, this morning, Christmas is a difficult time, and, and, and I know that. Uh, as I look around a uh, sanctuary filled with people this morning, um, you know, there's, there's mixed emotions. You know, some of you are, um, you know, you think about Christmas, and, and it just reminds you of what once was and is no longer. And so uh, yeah, one of the reasons we chose to, uh, to look at Colossians as we entered into this Christmas season was simply to prepare our hearts that regardless of where you're at whether it is truly the most wonderful time of the year or whether it's a difficult time for you that we can we can tune our hearts to what is most important at this time and and I trust uh, I trust as we have focused in on the person and work of Christ over the last few weeks that your heart has been encouraged that no matter what it is that you're facing or going through that you have you have a God you have a savior who's big enough to handle it uh, let's do this. Let's read our passage. We'll have a word of prayer, and we'll, we'll jump into this together this morning. He, uh, Colossians chapter 1, uh, looking at verses 19 and 20, it just simply says this, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we bow our hearts before you this morning, we come with thankful hearts, thankful for who you are. You are the God of all the universe, the creator of all things, and we were reminded last week that you have made all things, and that all is for you. Well, we are thankful not only for who you are, the one true God, but we're thankful for what you've done by your grace, by your love, you have moved to restore, to reconcile, to save a people for your, for your glory. And Father, we praise you this morning for the work of our Lord Jesus Christ who came, who gave himself that we might have life. And as we come to this portion of the service where we look to your word, Lord, I pray, as it's been said numerous times already this morning, give us ears to hear, for we need to hear from you. I pray that your word would go forth in power. Oh, it is, it is mighty. It is living. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. And may, may you accomplish your purpose among us today. We pray that you would open blinded eyes to see the beauty and the glory of Christ in the gospel. For those who, who may be here today who have yet to come to saving faith, Lord, may you, may you allow them to see their need today. As the gospel goes forth, not only here, but all around the world, we pray that we would see fruit, that your kingdom would advance and grow as we focus in and exalt the light of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, may you give us eyes to see more of him, even as, as your people who are, who are called by your name. Lord, may we grow in grace and knowledge. May the glory and, and the beauty and the person of Christ, may he be magnified in our, in our hearts, in our minds today. You know our needs and you know mine. Father, I pray that you would move in spite of me, that you might be glorified today. We pray all of this in the beautiful name of Jesus, our Lord, and amen. Well, last Sunday morning, we were reminded of the, the supremacy of Jesus Christ, right? that he is the supreme creator, right? That Jesus this baby who was born in a manger, that, that, that the Christ of Christmas is the creator of the cosmos, that Jesus made all things. He was involved intimately in the creation process, and he is still involved 
intimately with his creation, sustaining all things. Not only do we see that he's the head of creation, but he is also the head of the church. Right? And, and so if, if we're here this morning and we are uh, you know, part of his church, that means that we follow him, that he is He's the one who's leading, right? He's the one who's in charge. And so as his people, our, our heart should be to obey him in all things. And we finished up with just this simple idea that we saw in verse 18 of Colossians chapter 1, that he is the preeminence. It's simply meaning that he is first. And understanding, as we come to celebrate Christmas, and there's all of these distractions, Jesus is first. He's first, and he's meant to be first. Not just in all of creation, not just in the church, but he's meant to be first in your life. And so we ask ourselves again this morning, is, is Jesus first in my life? Is Jesus first in your life? Is he first in your heart, in your mind? Is he first in your family? Is he first in your, in your job? Is he first in, in your pursuits and in your goals and in, in whatever it is that you're seeking after? Is he first or are you placing other things in front of him? Other people in front of him? I, and I, I'm not saying that any of those things are necessarily even bad things. They can be really good things. You talk about family. Family is, is a priority for us as a church. And yet, if we put family before him, we've got things backwards. You know, I, we're supposed to, to lead and, and care and provide for our family. We, we need to meet, meet needs. But if we put our job if we put our career ahead of, of Christ and we put our career ahead of our family, then we've got things upside down. Matthew 6, says what? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all these things shall be added unto you. We put him first and all of these things fall into place. They fall in line as we follow Christ, the preeminent one. He is first. Right, and so we ask the question, and maybe you're here this morning, and, and you're hearing me say that, and you're going, why would I put this Jesus first? <laughs> why, why, would, why would I put this man who lived 2,000 years ago, why would, I, why, why, why would I have any care or concern about him at all? And so I want to, to come back and answer that question for you this morning. Why, why should we put him first? Number one, Jesus is preeminent. Jesus is first because of who he is. Because of who he is. Right? It, you know, Jesus is not merely a man who lived 2,000 years ago. He's so much more than that. Listen to, to verse 19 again. For in him, we're talking about Jesus here. We, we've seen that in the context repeatedly. For in him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. All the fullness of God in him. Right, we saw that in verse 15 last week. He is the image of the invisible God. When you look at Jesus, who do you see? You see God. Why do you see God when you look at Jesus? Because he's God. That's the answer, right? In him, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. When we talk about this Jesus, who we are claiming is to be first, first in creation, first in church, and first in your life and mine, we understand that we put him first because of who he is. He is God. The God of all creation. The God of all the universe. That, that's the point here in verse 19. This Jesus is fully God. We, we hold this truth unashamedly. And, and I know that there are, there are many, certainly around the world, culturally, that would disagree. You know, the, the question the question as to whether Jesus Christ is God is the issue that divides Christianity from all other religions. You, you, either, you either hold him to be divine, to be God, or, or not. Now, I mean, let, let's, there, there are many cults and world religions that would acknowledge Jesus Christ. They acknowledge that he is a good man. They acknowledge he's a great teacher, but not God. You know, the... We talked about the Jehovah's Witness a little last week, right? They would say that Jesus never claimed to be God, right? Buddhists, they would say that Jesus is not God, but rather an enlightened man, much like Buddha. They would say, yes, Jesus was a good man. He was a great teacher, but certainly not God, 
Right? The Christian scientist Mary Baker Eddy flatly stated, Jesus Christ is not God. Now, conversely, we believe that there is numerous incontrovertible evidence that Jesus Christ is God. Right? That this baby who was born in a manger has all the attributes and characteristics of God. I, I understand what I'm saying when I say that, right? Because it sounds insane, <laughs> right? It, it does. There, this, this little baby <laughs> that was born that we're going we're gonna to look at, God? It doesn't seem right. It doesn't sound right, right? <laughs> but this is one of the essential claims of Christianity. If Jesus is not God, he was just merely a man. And, and, and there are those many who would say, that's right, right. A man, yes, a good man, a great man, maybe even a perfect man. But if Jesus was, even if Jesus was a perfect man, he would have been an insufficient savior. See, the deity of Christ is essential for our salvation. If Jesus is not God, then he was not sufficient to be our salvation. He was not sufficient to provide forgiveness of sin. He was not sufficient to satisfy the wrath of a holy God if he was merely a man. You know, we realize this, if Jesus was just a man, then, then he has a fallen nature just like we do. And, and he's subject to sin, he's subject to, to make mistakes and and, and the, the reality is we, we can't trust him if he's just a man. He, we, we would have a hard time trusting his word, right? We would, we would think that there could be promises that he make that he may not keep, that, that he would not have the authority to do what he claimed to do. I'm thankful this morning that the overwhelming evidence points to the fact that Jesus is not just a man, but he is the God-man. And that's significant, right? He is the image of the invisible God, right? So Jesus Christ is God, but he is a man. <laughs> we don't want to discount that, right? We don't want to negate one or the other. Jesus Christ is unique in all of history. There's only one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. <laughs> Look over at verse 9 of chapter 2. Chapter 2 of Colossians in verse 9, it says... For in him, still talking about Christ, for in him the whole fullness of deity dwells. Now, that doesn't sound new, right? That's what we already said. <laughs> All the fullness of God is in him bodily. What's that talking about? That's talking about his humanity. That's talking about flesh, right? That's, that's, that's what Christmas is all about. The creator, the creator entered creation. This God that we looked at last week who was involved intimately in all creation, who made all things, he came. He came. Now, that's not a unique idea, right? That God would come and, 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 and interact with men. That myths and legends are filled with that, right? You look at Greek mythology and, and, and there, there's no shortage of gods who would come and, and interact with men. But there's nothing like Christianity. Jesus didn't just come, he became <laughs> something completely different. Jesus stands apart as the God who became man. He took on flesh. This is what we, this is what we call the incarnation. <laughs> God became man, and yet he retained the fullness of his deity, the God-man. We say this often and remind you this truth, right? Was Jesus Christ, was he God or was he man? And the answer is yes, <laughs> right? Both. He was 100% fully God, 100% fully man at the same time. We call that the hypostatic union. And I can't explain that fully, which again is just more evidence that he is what? He's God. He is God, right? And, 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 and so... That's what it means when we sing and we say, he is Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. God with us. That this God who made all things came to dwell among men. 
And the way in which he came is so miraculous. If, if you were God and you were going to enter into your creation, how would you come? Probably not as a baby. Probably, probably not helpless, right? Probably not placing yourselves in the arms of, of a teenage girl. Probably not in a manger. Probably not in this insignificant town of Bethlehem, right? If you and I were God and we were going to enter into our creation, we would come with all the pomp and circumstance, right? Here I am. Worship me. But we see the humility of Christ. He humbled himself. He condescended. Why? That he could accomplish the purpose for which he came. He came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom. This sets Jesus apart. Think about what it means for him to come. This God who, who framed the world. Who became a fertilized egg. An embryo, a fetus. God kicked, he kicked Mary from within her womb. I love the way uh, in, in his book, Max Lucado, his, his book called God Came Near. He wrote this, he said, God entered into the world as a baby. The omnipotent in one instant made himself breakable. He who had been spirit became pierceable. He who was larger than the universe became an embryo. And he who sustains the world with a word chose to be dependent upon the nourishment of a young girl. God as a fetus. Holiness sleeping in a womb. The creator of life being created. Is that not incredible? Miraculous? God came. God became. And just so we're all on the same page this morning, all right? In case you haven't caught up with me, right, I am saying unequivocally that this baby who was born in a manger, the son of Mary, who lived a short life in this small region of the known world, who taught multitudes of people, he fed the hungry, he ministered to the sick, he died a crimi criminal's death on a cross, this same Jesus is the one true God. The Bible is absolutely clear on this. There can be no... There's no mistaking it. Jesus himself claimed to be God. In John chapter 10 and verse 30, he said what? I am my father are one. We're one, right? Jesus claimed deity for himself. In John chapter 8 and verse 35, Jesus said, he said, truly, truly, I say to you before Abraham was, I am. Now, if you're not following along with that logic, Abraham lived a few thousand years before Jesus, and he says what? Before Abraham was, I am. And, and just for, you know, it's, it's hard for us because we're in this in the Western culture here in the 21st century, but for the Jews, when they hear Jesus say, I am, they understand that he's saying what? He's God, right? Because this is how God revealed himself to the Jewish people. I am that I am. And so when Jesus made that statement, the Jews picked up rocks to stone him. Why did they do that? Because he was making a very bold claim. He was saying, I am God. Yes, Jesus declared himself to be God. And the scripture repeatedly portrays him, claims that he is divine. Right? We'll, we'll go back. We'll go back 700 years before he was ever born to the prophecies of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Right? Emmanuel means God with us. So, yeah, there's going to be a baby who's going to be born and he's going to be God. <laughs> right? Isaiah 9, 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now, those are names that belong to God alone. You don't give those to anyone else but God. Mighty God, Everlasting 
Father. And we could look at example after example. And the thing is this. Not only did Jesus claim to be God, not only did the scriptures portray him as God, but Jesus did things that only God could do. When you look at his life, it stands apart. Yeah, yes, he was a good teacher. Yes, he was a great man. But he was so much more than that. Let's, let's jump to a, to a time in his ministry, in his life. I, I, you can look. It's Mark chapter 4 through 6. There's a time where Jesus is traveling across the Sea of Galilee with his disciples. He's wore out from ministry, right? just exhausted. He's asleep in the back of the boat, and while Jesus is sleeping, a raging storm, hurricane-force winds come across the Sea of Galilee, so much so that these experienced fishermen, these disciples, are afraid for their life. They've been on the Sea of Galilee their whole life, and yet they are pleading, and Jesus, wake up, we're going to die. And Jesus gets up out of his sleep and looks over the Sea of Galilee and does what? Peace be still. And the wave and the wind stopped. He commands the wind and the waves. All right, comes to the other side of the sea, begins to teach again. The multitudes gather around 20 to 25,000 people, and they get hungry. And Jesus looks at his disciples and says, you feed them. And they say, we got no food. And essentially what Jesus does with, with the equivalent of a Lunchable is feed 20,000 people. And then they collect all the leftovers and fill baskets full. And when they're finished, Jesus turns around and walks back across the Sea of Galilee. What is that? That's something only God can do. See, Jesus again and again demonstrated his divine power. He, he, he repeatedly showed his power over disease, healing the lame, the leper. <laughs> Dave sang about this this morning, did he not? The, the lame man, the blind man, the deaf man. Testimony after testimony. They came to him by the multitudes and they left whole and complete They could not hear, and they could hear. They could not see, and they could see. With a touch, with a word, Jesus healed time and time again. He showed power over demonic forces. There's a, a point in his ministry where he meets these, these uh, demon-possessed men. There's, there's an army of demons possessing these men, and at the word of Jesus, they flee. He commands them and throws them into a bunch of pigs, and they jump into the sea and causes a great big commotion, right? But he demonstrates power over demonic forces. And then he demonstrates power over death itself. If God were to come and dwell among men, this is exactly what you would expect, right? You would expect <laughs> diseases to be healed. You would expect evil demonic forces to be controlled. And you would expect death itself to quake in fear. And that's what happens. As he stands outside the tomb of his friend Lazarus and he says, Lazarus, come forth. And four days after he was dead, he walks out of the tomb. And if that's not enough, three days after they killed him on a cross, Jesus again lives and walks among his people. He conquers death. Yes, yes, he was a man, a great man, but he was God. And so we worship him and we put him first. Why? Because of who he is. He is the fullness. The fullness of God in the flesh. Now that, that word fullness was a real buzzword among the Colossians. It, it was, it, you'll, you'll see Paul make mention of it several times in his letter. The idea of being filled or, or experiencing the fullness. You say, why, why is that? Because among the Colossians, there was this teaching going around that Jesus is good, right? He's a good start, but he's not enough. He's not enough. I, I, you know, th th there's more to this religion. You, know, you can go deeper in your faith, and, and you can experience more, and we can add to what you've already got. And what was happening in the Colossian sh church can happen to us today very easily. 
it, it, it's possible you're here this morning and you just feel empty. Maybe, maybe you, you feel like something is missing today. Maybe you're just you're looking for satisfaction somewhere. You, you've been kind of running down, running this way, running that way, looking for something to fill that void. Can I say to you this morning that Jesus is enough? He is the fullness of of God. He is enough to meet your need, to fill that hole, to fill that void, to satisfy the longings of your heart. You know, even for the people of God who have, who have come and put their faith and trust in Him, it's not unusual for us to say, yes, I need Jesus so I can go to heaven. Right? I, need that, I need that help to get me to heaven, but I need some more for this life. He's not enough for me right now. I know one day I'm going. I'm on my way to heaven. Thank Jesus. And a lot of times Christians move away from him and look to other areas for satisfaction. And Paul's saying what? Don't do it. You don't need anything else. You don't need anyone else. Jesus alone is enough to satisfy your longing heart, to meet your needs, to fill the void. He is the living water who gives you a drink that you will never thirst. We can run to that well again and again and again. Yeah, I, I don't know where you're at this morning, but you know, it's possible that, yeah, you're, you're a Christian and you've put your faith in Christ, but you've been running here and there and everywhere looking for some joy and satisfaction. And my, my admonition to you would be to come back to Christ. Run back to him. Find your joy and satisfaction in him because in him you'll find all fullness. All the fullness of God. Now, not only do we see in our passage this morning that Jesus is first because of who he is, but he's also first because of what he has done. Right? He's because of who he is, yes, but because of what he's accomplished in verse 20. And through him to reconcile to himself All things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So Paul moves, right? He's been he's been putting before the Colossians. This is who Jesus is. He's the creator of the universe. He's the head of the church. He's first in all things. Right. This is God in the flesh. But now he moves to what Jesus Christ accomplished in his coming. Christ is God. He became man and in his In his flesh, in his life, he accomplished incredible things, right? Through him, he reconciled to himself all things. The idea of reconciliation, it just, it it means that there was, there's a relationship that is broken, right? That's what it means, Uh, that that those who were friends are now enemies, and to reconcile, he's going to bring them back together. That's what reconciliation is, right? So Jesus is going to reconcile all things. On heaven and earth, all things are reconciled through him. Now, we're going to see this as we continue in verses 21 through 23, right? That this reconciliation first and foremost applies to to the lost condition. This This is who we are as a result of our condition in Adam, right? That Adam fell, breaking that relationship, and as a result of being in Adam, you and I and all seven and a half billion people on the planet need reconciled to God. Jesus Christ made that possible. One one of the clearest verses that I could give you is Romans chapter 5 and verse 10. It says, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God. The Bible says apart from Christ, right, in in and of ourself, we are enemies of God. So if you're here this morning and you've never you've never experienced salvation, forgiveness of sin through the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible places you in a category of an enemy of God. And you would say more than likely, I've never come across anyone who's so has such animosity towards God. They would say he's my enemy. You probably wouldn't say that this morning. And yet, you are at enmity with God. Your relationship is broken because of your sin, because of your rebellion. But, 
while we were enemies, Christ reconciled. We've been reconciled to God by what? By the death of his son. Much more now we are reconciled, shall be saved by his life. By Jesus' life and by his death, that relationship can be restored. So if you're here this morning and you are living in sin and rebellion and you've walked away from this God who made you, that relationship can be restored today. You can experience this this reconciliation. Do you do you have do you have peace with God? If 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 you were to take your last breath today, do you have full assurance and confidence? That you would be in a right relationship with him. You know, that's, that's what Jesus made possible. It says what? He made peace by the blood of his cross. Where there was enmity. Where there was rebellion. Where there was sin. Where there was a broken relationship. Jesus made peace. Through his cross. Through his blood. You think, well, that blood simply represents his death. By our sin, we have made an enemy of God. By Jesus' death, he has made it possible for us to have peace with God. We, 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 we sing about it so much, right? Peace on earth, <laughs> goodwill toward men. At this time of, of year, we think a great deal about peace. Jesus is the peacemaker. He's the one who makes it possible to have this Right relationship through him. He reconciles not only people to God, but he reconciles all things. Now, I want to be really careful here because there are some who like to grab a hold of verse 20 and say what? That if Jesus reconciles all things to himself through his death, then all people will be saved in the end. Right? So universalists like to take this and say, you know what? In the end, everyone's going to be saved. What's the problem with that? It doesn't reconcile with the rest of Scripture. Right? You, You can't do it. There's... There's too many places where where we're told again and again that fallen angels and those who refuse to believe in Jesus Christ will what? Will be cast into the lake of fire for all eternity, right? So universalism is a myth. If you're one of those people who kind of believe, you know, I can live however I want to live, and I know that God is a loving God, and one day when I stand before him, he's going to say, you know what? I love you. Come on in. I know you didn't, you know, I know you didn't believe me. I didn't even follow me, but. People have that idea of God, right? That he's just like this, this nice grandpa, right? This big man upstairs, and one day you'll stand before him, and he'll just go, well, you know, son, you know, it wasn't really what I had in mind, but come on. God's not like that. He's holy. He's just. He's righteous. By his nature, he must judge sin. And if we refuse, we refuse Jesus Christ, if we, if we turn our back to his gift, we'll spend eternity separated from him forever in, in a place called hell. Yes, God loves. He loves so much that he gave his son. But if you spurn that gift and turn away from him, you will perish. Do you have peace with God? So many of you have experienced that. Right, you've experienced so. So, so when, when Jesus is talking about reconciling all things, what is he saying here? Well, we we're so small minded, aren't we? Jesus is so much bigger than than what we. You know, Jesus did more than just save me and you when he died on the cross. Jesus restored all of creation to himself. Right? When Jesus went to the cross and bore the penalty for sin, understand when sin entered into the world, it affected not just humanity, but it affected all creation. All creation fell under a curse and is groaning, waiting until the time of restoration. You can see that in Romans chapter 8. So when it says that he's going to reconcile all things to himself, it simply means that he's going to set all things right. One day there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth where we're going to enjoy perfect fellowship, perfect reconciliation with the God of the universe. You know, there's so much here by way of application this morning. You know, because Jesus is one who reconciles, who makes peace, brothers and sisters, we are to be peacemakers. 
We're to be those who are, we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. You know, one of the things I love about Christmas time is it gives us an increased opportunity to point people to Jesus. Right? We, have, we have week after week, day after day, opportunities to remind people that Christmas is ultimately about Jesus. And we celebrate because of him, because of who he is, because of what he's done. And so, brothers and sisters, let us, let us boldly proclaim this good news to those we come in contact with. The ministry of reconciliation is sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ so those who are perishing will hear and trust and turn to him. At the same time, this, this affects our lives intimately, right? If, if, if you're here this morning and there are broken relationships, right, within your home, within your family, among your friends, even your enemies, right, we have been called to be peacemakers. Right? It, if you need to reconcile with, with your husband or your wife or you need to reconcile with, some, with a family member or with a close friend, maybe there's some things between you that aren't right, See the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church, and say what? I'm willing to humble myself. I'm willing to, I'm willing to lay down my life that this relationship might be restored. Maybe there's some forgiveness that needs to be offered. Maybe there's a confession that needs to be, maybe, there's some, maybe you need to ask for forgiveness. Whatever it may be, following the example of our Lord Jesus Christ, why not be a peacemaker, a peacemaker. You know, <laughs> we see the, the supremacy of Christ once again. This, this Jesus that we celebrate at Christmas, this baby in a manger is God in the flesh. And he is worthy of all our worship and all our love and all our service. And if you don't know him, that is your greatest need today. And when I say no, I mean that in, in the most intimate way possible. Jesus wants to know you. He wants to, he wants to be in a relationship with you. And if you will turn away from your sin and, and ask him to save you, he will. We read about it in, in John chapter 1, our scripture meditation in the morning, right? He came to his own, his own received him not, but to as many as receive him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God. You can enter into a new relationship with God through Jesus Christ, or you can turn away from him like many have done and many will do. And broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many, many there are that go that way. Narrow is the way that leads to life. And few there are that find it. For us as his people this morning, are you finding your satisfaction and your joy in Jesus? putting him first in your heart and your life. What better time than now to humbly say, Lord Jesus, I want you at Christmas time to be first in this area of my life. I'm going to give it to you. Let's close in prayer this morning, if you would.